this week on the Back Table Podcast. And he pulled me aside one day as a resident and he gave me an article on finding wonder or something like that. And I wish I could remember the title of the article, but he said, Matt, you should read this. It struck me as kind of out of character for him, actually, because I didn't really understand. But I think as you age and as you become, you know, a senior surgeon, things become more of the same. And you seemingly lose the ability to ask that question, huh, that's weird. Why do we do it like that? Because it's just the way you've always done it. It becomes tacit knowledge. And I think if you actively try and preserve that sense of wonder, you are more likely to have a long life in the innovation sphere because you continually question the world and, and try and find those better ways. And I think that comes more and less naturally to people. And to the innovators out there who are thinking about doing their own idea, short answer, start today. Don't wait, just start, see what happens. It might not work, but that's okay. You'll enjoy the process. Just start today. Well, welcome to Backtable Innovations Podcast. I'm your guest host, Eric Gantworker. I'm a pediatric otolaryngologist, as well as part of a technology startup and interested in video games, education, and technology. And so I have a very esteemed guest on for today. This is Dr. Matthew Bromwich. He is a full-time surgeon at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario and an associate professor of otolaryngology at the University of Ottawa. He is the lead and clinical director for the CHEO Innovation Program 880. Dr. Bromwich is the inventor of several medical devices and holds five pens that we're going to talk about. And in 2005, he founded Clearwater, which is now known as Shoebox, which now employs over 100 people and develops and distributes medical devices worldwide and was recently acquired. Today's theme on Backtable Innovation, we're going to be talking about the innovator's soup. And we're going to talk about intelligent ignorance and wonder with Dr. Matthew Bromwich. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Eric. Thanks so much for having me. Real pleasure to be here. Absolutely. So, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, people who are very interested in sort of how you got started. And I want to caveat that with, you know, you are still a practicing physician and you're sort of going into this area of technology, innovation, entrepreneurship. And a lot of people come and ask, how did you even get started? Where did this idea come from? Where did you even contemplate the idea of doing something outside of clinical practice? I think the origin stories and those startup stories are always really fun. And uh, I think it was actually Hemingway talking about bankruptcy that said very slowly, then all at once. And that's kind of how it happened. It all happened very, very slowly, then kind of all at once. And people say that in the innovation world all the time about uh, an overnight success 10 years later. Um, and so I don't think this was really any different than, than that at all. But honestly, as a clinician, it starts with problems, things that annoy you, really. And maybe it's the short-tempered among us that finally build up the fortitude to try and do something and, and change the world. Absolutely. And so, you know, were there are skills that you had coming into medicine that you weren't necessarily utilizing that were sort of itching to get involved in this space? Charles Kettering uh, was a fascinating guy. He talked about intelligent ignorance as the only way to get things done. And I think that is really true. I'm a smart guy, but honestly, not knowing how difficult this was actually was probably helpful. And that's one of the things I worry about when we talk about it too much. It's nearly impossible to change anything and get anywhere with any of this. And so the fact that anybody does it all is nothing short of miraculous. And, and it's the same reason why 99% of startups fail, because it's really difficult. So I think being ignorant of that fact was probably my greatest asset. So that's a really interesting thing, because a lot of people who I've talked to in this space the first question they ever ask is, why is it done this way? Or why hasn't this been done? And I think it sort of speaks to that intelligent ignorance. So what was the first thing? What was the, why is this not done this way? Or why is this happening? What was that first question for you? Well, for me, I think when you see the same problem over and over and over and over and over and over again, you really start to wonder, really, is this the best we can do? You know, and so one that, that gets me now is, is a classic ENT problem that everybody has is actually earwax. So the state of the art for earwax is a small stick that we poke in our ears that says on the box, don't put in your ear. And so that's just ripe for innovation because it's so ridiculous that that's actually the best we've got. You know, 10,000 years of human evolution later, we have a stick we put in our ear. So it's things like that that get my goat. Uh, for me, though, the first one was actually the most common cause of dizziness, which is called BPPV or benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. It's so common that everyone listening to this show 
knows somebody with it. About one in 10 people over 60. So one of your parents or grandparents or their friends that you'll see over the holidays. If you bring this up, do you have dizziness when you lay down and roll over? Somebody is going to say yes. And so interestingly, the guy who invented this, John Epley, the treatment for this in the late 80s was actually ostracized because the treatment for this disease is so ridiculous. It's unbelievable. Essentially, BPV is caused by small crystals in your inner ear. And the treatment for it is to roll the person's body around in a somewhat esoteric way that it makes the whole dizziness come, but then go away for long periods of time. And John Epley would initially anesthetize people in the OR, roll them around, wake them up, and then say he was done. And the anesthesiologists were so aghast, they thought this guy should be shot or barred from the hospital. And so it's one of those unfortunate stories of the guy who actually figured out the right answer. It was so far ahead of his time, so to speak, that everybody else ostracized him. And to this day, we don't really have a great treatment for BPV other than this repositioning maneuver. But we would teach people how to do it, but it's so esoteric, people couldn't really follow it. And so two weeks later, they kind of forgot. And so I was like, this is ridiculous. How can we get them to roll around at home better? We don't need to take them to the operating room to do this. And so I invented this device I call the Dizzy Fix, which is essentially a visual analog of the maneuver. And for those of you that have ever played that game with a wooden box, with a ball in it, with a maze where you tilt the box around and the ball rolls around and falls down those holes, it's basically that, but for your head. So you put it on as a hat, you look in front of yourself and you see a little game that you play. And if you win the game by moving your head around, you're cured. And it takes about three minutes. And it, to my mind, it's so much better than people waiting months to years to see their ENT doctor to get rolled around for three minutes to then be told they're cured, you know, much to their amazement. These people are just amazed. They're like, no, 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 that can't be true. I've been dizzy for years. I can't be cured three minutes later. And you can challenge them. You're like, go ahead, lie down, roll over. You're not dizzy. And they're not. And they leave so happy. And so it's so great to be able to allow them to do this in the comfort of their own home. And you bring up a really good point because your idea when you came to this was there's ridiculous how this is already being done. And there's a much easier way to do this and have people sort of feel better and get better. There's another leap that says, I want people to feel better and get better. And I have an idea to actually putting that into action. And when you decided, hey, I have a way to fix this and you even prototyped it, what was that next step? Like, What was the first thing you did when you're like, hey, I need to create this as a commercial product or get it out there? Like, What was that first step like? I think one of the things that you have to believe, and actually Freeman Dyson, for those Star Trek nerds among us, will remember the Dyson sphere from one of the episodes where they created this entire civilization around a star to harvest all the energy from the star. That guy. Anyway, he talks about science as being a rebellion against the status quo. Because for you to actually think you have a better idea than somebody else, you actually have to first reject that other idea. So it's a bit of a odd thing to say when we think about scientists as being rebellious. You just, that seems to not compute. And so I think one of the important first steps is to look at your environment with an open mind, you know, a curious mind, and then reject what you see and what other people tell you, which is an odd thing to do. That's where you get to the, hmm, I wonder if I could do that better somehow. And this is the classic question, you know, Thomas Edison even used to say this all the time, there's a better way to do it find it as classic, you know, quote from Thomas Edison. And so I think keeping that mind in your everyday life and recognizing those moments of power, if you will, where that happens to you and you go through your day and like, oh, this is so annoying. This is so irritating. I bet you I could do this better. And if you feel like that, stop, recognize it. And there's an opportunity. It is also a lot of work to then execute on that. But that's the first step. Absolutely. And I think, you know, innovation takes advantage of competition in some sense. Because there's a lot of people who have an idea and it's like, this, is, this has to have already been done, right? You know, if Google gave up when web crawler came out, there would never be Google, right? Think about the entire auto industry that really drove each other towards the innovation and actually continues to propel. There's a reason why there's lots of different companies doing the same thing. So how did you get past that discouragement that like there might be somebody else doing this that might, somebody's working on this already. Somebody who has more money, has more capital, has more interest. How do you get past that from an introspective standpoint? Yeah, I think your first point, which is competition is good, is where I'll end up with my comments because that's very true. But I think what I found out is my first idea, I honestly don't remember what it was that I ever had, but the first thing I looked up, is anyone else doing this? And then I realized, oh, that was patented 35 years ago or something <laughs> embarrassingly ridiculous. 
And then, you know, a few years later, I had another idea. Oh, and then I looked that up and it was patented, you know, 10 years ago. And then I got closer and closer and closer to today. And I think what is happening in that is you're becoming an expert or a leader in your field. And that happened to me as I was getting older, better educated, becoming a professional, because the barrier to entry gets higher and higher as you get deeper and deeper into whatever your field is. So if you've invented the pet rock, you know, anyone could have invented the pet rock. And so you're going to face a lot of competition. But as you focus in areas that you know about, there will be less and less competition and you will get closer and closer to being the one who first thought about something. So that's good. Point number one. Point number two about that, though, is that it's actually lonely out front. Uh, if you're an innovator and you're rejecting the status quo, that means you're kind of alone. You're not accepting the group's standard philosophy about something. You know, you're kind of the weirdo who thinks something different than the group. And so when you find somebody else that thinks like you, that might be your competitor, it's actually in a strange way, kind of nice because you're not alone. Somebody else thinks this is a good idea. And that's one of the reasons competition is good because it actually validates that you're not chasing a totally crazy idea. Like, let's imagine you're actually clinically insane. No one else will be doing what you're doing, right? You'll never see somebody competing with you. But if you find somebody that's doing that, that's a good thing. The last and third point actually has to do about timing. Some things you can't invent at certain times, or maybe you do, you know, Galileo and the world being round, maybe not the right time for him because he was, you know, ostracized by the church and whatnot. It wasn't a great time to make that discovery, but there are, due to synergies of technology and different things, times where ideas reach their appropriate time. And I think if you can sort it out that your innovation reaches that climax at the right time, it'll just be much better. And you'll see other people identifying those trends in technology and capitalizing on it as well. And that's where you see competition and it's a good thing. It's interesting how ideas sort of ebb and flow through the time. You know, I, I always talk about tracheostomies in history that when George Washington was on his deathbed, that tracheostomies was very controversial at the time. It had existed for millennia, but at that time it was out of fab. It was considered barbaric. And had they actually done a tracheostomy on George Washington, they actually would have saved his life. But, you know, it was just happened to be a dip in the time of popularity. One of the things you, you brought up was that some of your ideas sort of met their end. And I really want to dig in on, on failure. One of the things as clinicians that we don't necessarily accept is failure, at least in the, in the grand sense. But in innovation, failure actually is a driving force. Can you talk a little bit more, even beyond Dizzy Fix, some of your other ideas, some of your other things, where failure was a driving force and sort of helped you guide you to some more successful areas? Yeah, I love, this is my favorite Churchill quote about this, you know, success is moving from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm. And I guess he was talking about the war, or I'm not sure what, but it's also true in life. And I think it depends on, again, so many people have gone before us. There's so many great things to draw from. You know, again, Edison, you know, learned 2000 ways not to make a light bulb. You do learn a lot in failure. And I think if you look at it as your one shot and if it doesn't work, you're going to give up. It's probably the wrong way to look at innovation. Like it, it just doesn't work that way. And I think if you're open-minded, you may not end up doing what you set out to do. You know, when I started Clearwater in 2005, I set out to basically make an innovation think tank where I wanted to do different things and I wanted to do a number of different projects and, and maybe be that crazy person who lives in a bat cave, has a waterfall driveway, you know, something like that is, is probably what I wanted. It didn't turn out that way. It turned into a company and companies have a life of their own where they want to employ people and they want to make revenue and they want to actually focus. And I think as an academic, you have the luxury of having a broad outlook on things, but as a company, you're almost necessitated to really focus on your product and become better at delivering it at low cost while increasing quality. And that's basically how you become successful as a company. And so I didn't really end up doing what I set out to do at all. So does that make it a failure? No, I don't think so. It just did different things. And so looking for those opportunities, even in failure is where you find success. That's interesting because there's a lot of people who start companies and have a vision and they're so steadfast in that vision, they don't see the pivot points. So take me back to that point where you felt the, your original idea was pivoting and you deliberately decided to go with the pivot instead of sort of pursuing straight on. Was it a change of mindset? What exactly was your thought process at that point? Well, I feel like I'm quoting a lot of people, but there's so much great advice out <laughs> I know, there. It's so, it's so good. 
is um, Darwin, right? Darwin says about evolution that it is not the smartest or the best that survive. It's the most adaptable. And that is true of innovation as well. So you're totally right. Identifying those pivot points is essential. And there's been many. I think so long as you're enthusiastic and somewhat ignorant about the blocks in front of you, you probably get there. And at first I had five medical advice devices, and now essentially, or arguably I have one. And they talk about this in writing books or stories as well, which is you have to kill your darlings. It sounds terrible, but I think the idea is you might have characters that you really like, but they just don't fit and they don't advance the story. And maybe it confuses the reader and you have to kill them off and not put them in your story. And that's a really hard thing for an author to do. And I think similarly, it's really hard as an innovator to let an idea go because you have a limited amount of time and a limited amount of money. And if you spread it too thin, you're never going to succeed. And making the right bet or pivoting to the right thing at the right time is one of those skills. And I think one last thing I would say about that is as a newcomer to innovation, you're going to make that decision incorrectly, probably. And that's really where your advisory board comes in super handy or an experienced innovator to help you recognize that and say, huh, because your head's down on whatever it is you're doing, you know, full on doing it. And you may not bring up, come up for air enough to see where you're going. Uh, and that's where your team will hopefully help you make those pivots. Yeah. We're going to come back to sort of the collaborators, mentors, advisors in a second, but I wanted to clue in on something you said about time. And I think one of the things that I hear from a lot of physicians who are especially interested in this, in this space, how do you have time? You know, how do you allocate time to do this? And I think the two things that people always ask about is, how did you get the time? How did you get the money? And I think that's an apropos conversation for here. How did you get the time? How did you get the money? This is a bit of an uncomfortable question for two reasons. One, I had feedback once that I was late for something. And the feedback was not that they were mad, but just that the person I was late for was like, it's okay, Matt, but you need to realize that this means to me that I'm not a priority. And I felt bad about that because they are a priority, but whatever I was doing was more important. And you have a fixed amount of time and you just have to prioritize. But the downside of that is it means stuff that you still honestly feel is valuable is going to drop off. And you might be rude to the people around you because you're late. You might be rude to your spouse because you're busy. You might ignore your kids. You know, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with that because there's not that much time. And so it's, it's really hard to find the time. And most people start off evenings and weekends and it's their passion project. And you'll find that you can't pay people to be as passionate as you will be about your own idea for free. You know, like you, if you find other people that in your, that you want to employ that are as passionate, they'll do it for free, you know, whereas you can't get that out of somebody with money. And so being that kind of person yourself, you'll, you'll find time. I don't think that's the, the problem. It, the problem is what you have to give up and or who to make it. Yeah. I mean, that's the hard part. And especially when you are so passionate and you have to drive it yourself as the, as the originator. There are things that definitely you have to pass up. It's hard to, as a clinician, still operating, still seeing patients because we're never really off. You know, it's not like you're off service, you know, especially as surgeons, you know, you have patients that are in the hospital or that you are still always on call for. So how do you manage your time, I guess, is the way do you actually work on scheduling? Do you set aside Somebody told me uh, long ago that the, the way that they wrote a book was they promised themselves that they would set aside 15 minutes a day to write. And you realize that if you set aside and actually schedule 15 minutes a day, by the end of the week, you have five times seven amounts of time actually writing. And I think that's really sort of germane to what we're talking about. But how did it work out for you and how did you sort of allocate time? I think, you know, you've, you've seen that framework of time management where there are those things that are urgent and important that you do first. And then there's things that are urgent, but not important that are distractions. And then there's things that are not urgent, but important. And those are the ones that are really tricky because if it's not urgent and not important, you just don't do it. But if it's not urgent, but very important, how do you find time to do that box of, of things? I mean, I think that's where, you know, being good with your calendar, uh, setting aside time, it's like getting to the gym. It's not urgent. It's very important. Everyone knows that if you're going to do a, a workout routine, you better schedule time for it. Because if you just, oh, I'll do it when I have time, that will never, ever happen. 
And so for me, having a regular routine to do those non-urgent but important things was essential. That's excellent. And, you know, I think one of the things that is an interesting conversation is, you know, both you and I are in academic institutions and really navigating those waters when it comes to time, when it comes to sort of, you know, intellectual property, which we can touch upon here if we want to, you know, what has been your advice for other people who are trying to navigate this academia entrepreneurship space? I think that's really challenging and it really depends on your institution because some institutions will have very supportive policies. And you hear people say about conflict of interests. I think the elucidated among them will say, if there's no conflict, there's no interest, which is actually a great way to look at it. Because whenever you have a good idea and do something, then there should be a conflict. And that means there is interest, uh, which is great. You just have to be transparent at your institution. So at Harvard happens to have a conflict of interest policy that I really like because it's very supportive about having that, meaning people are doing things that I find is very supportive of having these conflicts. And whenever you are at the forefront and the front edge of your field, you're going to create these conflicts. And it means you're doing something versus the safest position is to never do anything. Then you'll never have a conflict of interest. So you just have to disclose it and ideally work with your institution. Yeah, I think disclosure has been definitely the technique that I've used. You know, violent transparency has been a term that I have adopted here is always be upfront and honest and then say, you know, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm planning, being very careful about resources, you know, not borrowing resources from the institution, which sort of brings me back to, you know, a lot of people have good ideas. They're not independently wealthy. What is your thought for people who are, have a great idea and they think that it's going to transform the world, but they're not independently wealthy. They don't have these massive grants. They don't have a funding source. What is your advice for folks who are wanting to sort of look into how am I going to fund my idea? Yeah, that is a real tough one. I forget who was talking about this, but I think they were talking about the railway or the oil industry in the 1800s. You know, every fortune started with a crime. Is <laughs> right? So I'm not sure I would fund it with a crime. But what I mean by that is even for myself, Dizzy Fix, I was in that situation. I had no money. I was a resident at the time. In fact, I was hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. And yet I had this idea that I thought was great. And I actually went to the hospital and said, hey, guys, I got this idea. I think it would solve this very annoying problem for all your patients. And then the response I got was, we don't do that here. <laughs> so true. <laughs> and I was shocked. I'm like, what do you mean? This treats and cures a patient and you don't want to do that. They're like, yeah, but we use other people's ideas to treat and cure patients. We don't make up our own. And this was at the Research Institute, which I was like, well, wait a second. We're supposed to be doing research and discovering things. Yes, we're supposed to be studying things, but we're not inventing things. And I was like, this is so weird. And so I didn't know what to do because I had disclosed to the hospital and I had said, I, I think this would be great. And well, I guess I'll do it myself. And, you know, I did. I got the small resident grants, $5,000 here and this and that but I couldn't figure out what to do with it. And so eventually I went to somebody to sort of partner. I went to, I was actually at a trade show and I met this guy who was selling some other widget, which seemed kind of similar. And I said, hey, listen, I see you're selling that widget. Do you want to sell my widget? Now, I'm not giving you this advice because you're not supposed to do this at trade shows. Those people are there to sell stuff to you. You're not supposed to sell your stuff to them. So I didn't know that at the time. Uh, again, intelligent ignorance, but he was kind of interested and he said, sure. And so I showed him all the stuff at another time. And I said, do you want to buy, you know, 10,000 of them? He actually said, yes. And I didn't even have the product. And so I said, well, would you pay me half up front? And he said, okay. I'm like, huh. And so he gave me, I forget what it was, but $50,000 or something to make 10,000 of these units. And then I delivered them late, obviously. And they were all broken. A hundred percent of them were broken. <laughs> And so I had the other 25,000, which was my profit, which I then spent on another 10,000 units, which I then delivered and they were okay. But he ordered another 10,000 after that. So I did it again and again and basically went on from there. So it's not a crime, but it is kind of miraculous that it worked out. So I, I wouldn't suggest doing it that way. It's a long way of saying that. But you basically have three options. You do it yourself, you partner with somebody else, or you sell it to somebody else. So if you do it yourself, you need the money some way or another. You get investors, you get friends and family, you get grants, you know, you work on the side, which a lot of people do. You partner, which is the number two one, which is what I would suggest for most people. So go find somebody who does something kind of similar and convince them that they should do what you think they should do and figure out some remuneration strategy. That's vastly the easiest way of doing it. 
Now, the caveat there is that most people are doing what they're doing and not what you're doing because they think what they're doing is the right thing to do. Back to the innovator is alone. Like if they, let's talk about chairs. We're both sitting in chairs. I actually did go to a chair manufacturing company for one of my ideas and said, hey, listen, I got a, an idea for a better chair. They kind of quietly escorted me out of the building. <laughs> You know, because they, they're they like, we know chairs. What do you know about chairs? You know, I, and true, I didn't know anything about chairs. So I would expect that most of the time your offer of partnering will be rejected. But sometime, you know, one in 30, one in 100, so this is where the persistence and the unreasonable persistence comes in. People will say, huh, maybe let's try it out. Maybe you're right. And the third one, which everyone dreams of, which happens almost never, is sell your idea to somebody else who's going to do it, pay you millions of dollars. That I'm just going to say never happens. So the first one where you're the inventor happens almost never, one in a hundred. The second one where you partner with somebody, I'm going to say happens 20% of the time. And the third one where you sell it and make millions of dollars happens never. So, but those are really the only three things you can do. It's definitely an interesting area now because there's a lot of these innovation hubs and these accelerators and everybody watches Shark Tank and they think, you know, Kickstarter, all this stuff, these ways to get these seed funding for what you're doing. And obviously venture capital, you know, have you, have you forayed into looking into these accelerators, these innovation hubs and these, you know, sort of institutional shark tanks and VC and what has been your impression of, of taking ideas to them and, and whether that's a viable solution for folks who are listening here? Definitely. But I think the problem with medical innovation is it takes somewhere around seven years. So you have a new idea. And you have to do all the regulatory stuff. You have to do the research. You have to make your product and you have to start a business. Da, da, da. I would not be surprised. I have no real evidence about this, but it feels like five to seven years. Whereas regular startup businesses, I have a technology platform or whatever, probably two years. So to sort of get started and get going. So this, that's a real problem with health innovation because of the barrier to entry and the highly regulated and risk averse environment. But let's imagine you do have a product. So it's the research phase is done. So you're at year two or three of this, you know, endeavor and you have a product. The next barrier is, do you have a customer? Now, if you have a product that for whom there is no customer, like maybe people like it, but they're not the people who pay for it. That's a real problem. So maybe your hospital is the only person that can pay for it, but they're not the customer. The patient is the customer and the hospital doesn't want to pay for it. You know, you're basically screwed. So you need to figure out while you're developing your product, is this something I could sell to someone who would also be willing to buy it? Now, they also need to be able to buy it in a way that they can buy it. So another example might be hospitals who were used to buying MRI machines, like it's a capital cost, but they're not so used to buying subscriptions, but you have a subscription model, but they don't have a budget for a subscription. And so there are other problems about your product and, and your product market fit, essentially. But let's imagine you have a good product and you have a customer who you can sell it to, who can also has a way to, to actually buy it or pay for it. Those are the kind of things that you need to have before you go to a venture capitalist, in my view. And the third thing you need is experience. Now, venture capitalists, despite all their charts and all their smarts about how this works, essentially rely on one thing when they're deciding who to invest in. Who are you? And that's it, the team. And so if you have a strong team with somebody who knows how this works, that's essentially the only thing they look at. Sure, they look at the rest of the stuff. Is it legal? You know, their due diligence happens, but it's more of a checkbox that they might go through 10 different things and say, yeah, it meets all those criteria. You know, it has freedom to operate. It's not illegal. It seems like it'll make money, you know, but if facing two of the identical situations, how, what's the tiebreaker? Who the team is. And so this is where having your ducks in a row and being an A player yourself attracts other A players because that's who you want on your team when you go to the VCs. So it's really interesting because you talk about building the right team. And, and I think one of the things we all have to recognize is that there are limits to our abilities. We may have a great idea. We may have a great vision, but there's going to be blind spots. There's going to be things that we need help with. And, you know, Jim Collins in, in Good to Great always talked about the bus, right? Getting the right people on the bus having a direction for the bus and then getting it to the destination. And I wanted to hear about that process for you. How did you find collaborators? How did you find mentors? Who did you reach out to? Did you get part of any kind of online communities to sort of test your idea? You know, how did you go about that? I think I like the analogy of a bus because this whole process is a journey, right? And through that journey, you might be the only person on the bus at some point, you know, you're by yourself. 
but there are going to be essential people who will get on the bus and people who will get off the bus at different times during that journey. And really, I think the three essential spheres of, or the locations to which you will travel are these. Number one, the healthcare sphere where you're the expert. So you might be the only person on the bus because you know what the problem is. And that healthcare space is all about, is this idea necessary? Because there's nothing worse than a technological solution for a non-existent problem. It's like when they try and sell you laser beams at the hospital and you're like, what's it for? And they're like, well, it's like a knife. And I'm like, but I have a knife. Yeah, but it's a, but it's a laser. And I'm like, but is it better in any other way? You could just say it's a laser. It's all like, yeah. It's like that makes a sharks, sharks with laser beams <laughs> attached to their heads. That's right. So the healthcare sphere is really about, is it necessary? Now, the research sphere you have to go to in healthcare because you need to validate whether your technology is works and, and cross that regulatory barrier. And that's kind of about, is it possible? Like, does this work and can you prove it? The third one is the business sphere, which is about, is this a viable business? And in each of those spheres, it's like different continents. They speak different languages. And if you go from healthcare talking about patients and impact and you wander over to business, and you say that, they're like, well, that's nice, but I'll see you later. Versus if you talk about return on investment or other things like that, that business people talk about. And if you talk about, you know, patient care in research, they say, well, that's good, but what's your question? You know, what's your hypothesis? What are the researchy things that you need? And so just like you wouldn't travel on a bus to different countries without a map or without a translator, you shouldn't do this without people on your bus that speak different languages or know the terrain, so to speak. And that's really why I see that as a, as a truism about this journey. You need those people. Now, we all don't know those people. But one thing that I've learned, much like what's happening right now, people will give you advice for free, almost too much of it. And so just ask. Ask whoever you want as much as possible. And most people will talk to you. And some people will talk to you every month. I've asked maybe five or six or seven people, will you be my mentor? I know that sounds strange, but I straight up ask them. I'm like, listen, man, can we talk like once a month, maybe half an hour? Just, I got a lot of questions and I really respect, you know, what you've done. Nobody has said no. Everyone's like, wow, Matt, that's, that's wow. Okay. Yeah, no, I would love to do that. And, you know, great. Get some free, great advice. Absolutely. And I found that very much the same when I reached out to people, even very high up people at very large companies that everybody would know. I just literally cold emailed them or reached out on LinkedIn and said, can I just bend your ear for a little bit? And they were absolutely so accommodating. And I think people are so fearful to reach out. And I've had people reach out to me and I, obviously I give them all the time because I want to foster that, that relationship and I want to foster innovation because it's exciting. And I think people like sharing that excitement with others. And I think that's, that's what sort of gets me excited about this space. Out of all those people that you reached out to, what was the best advice you got? Oh my, that's so hard to answer. What was the best advice I got? What was the worst advice you got? How about we'll start thinking. <laughs> <laughs> They're those like, don't, really don't, do it, don't do it, Matt, don't do it. I think the best advice I got well, I, there's so many good pieces of advice, but I think one actually, this uh, who's not an entrepreneur, but his name is Demir Maddock. He's a plastic surgeon in London, Ontario. And he pulled me aside one day as a resident and he gave me an article on finding wonder or something like that. And I wish I could remember the title of the article, but he said, Matt, you should read this and just don't forget it. And it was, it struck me as kind of out of character for him, actually, because I didn't really understand. But I think as you age and as you become, you know, a senior surgeon, things become more of the same and you seemingly lose the ability to ask that question. Huh, that's weird. Why do we do it like that? Because it's just the way you've always done it and becomes tacit knowledge. And I think if you actively try and preserve that sense of wonder, you are more likely to have a long life in the innovation sphere because you continually question the world and, and try and find those better ways. And I think that comes more and less naturally to people. The worst advice I got, Probably you're right. Give up. This will never go anywhere. <laughs> right. And people said that to everybody again. Who is it? Einstein, I think, you know, as a patent clerk, people said, you're never going to go anywhere. You know, right. you failed math. Or he failed math. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. You'll never make anything of yourself. Okay. Just don't listen to naysayers. I think that the, the really the most important thing, and as you say, we do this because we love it. And I have actually beside my desk here, a little quote about living a life that sets your soul on fire. You really need to do that. You need to live the way that excites you because life is short. And if you're not, I heard this the other day, the longer you wait for your future, the shorter it will be. And so every day, you know, you need to passionately pursue your future because 
it's fun and it sets your soul on fire and you are walking towards, you know, your future. When I was a fellow at Boston, uh, Dr. Jerry Healy came and gave us a talk. He was retired at that time, but he's sort of the pillar of, of pediatric laryngology, one of the fathers of pediatric laryngology. He gave a talk called What's Your Dash? And I walked in, I was like, what do you mean, what's your dash? And he's like, you know, the, the, t the date you were born, the date you died, there's a dash in between. How do you, what do you want people to talk about the dash? And like that stuck with me and it sticks with me to this day. Like when I'm gone, what is the legacy you want to leave? And it's not like, you know, I don't want to shower people with money and fame and stuff like that. It's really, what is the character and the identity that you want to leave behind with those who are still around? And I like that lecture sticks with me to, to this day. The other anecdote that I'll say is that exactly what you told me was what I heard when I started splitting my time between clinical practice and working for a technology startup. I met again, another father of pediatric ENT, somebody different in an event. I never met him before. And he said, hi, you know, what do you do? He introduced himself. I introduced myself. I said, well, you know, and I'm splitting my time between clinical practice and working for this technology startup. And he said, what a waste of your talent and literally walked away. And this is like one of the fathers of our, of our specialty who told me this. And instead of, you know, being taken aback and like, oh my God, questioning my life, I instead use that as motivation to be like, you know what? That was a different era. You know, medicine is not what it was back then. And when he was, when he was practicing, and I think that's a lot of us have gotten that just don't do it advice. Yeah. You know, what's funny about that. Have you watched the, the TV show, the Nick, I think it's about the of Nick course. Walker hospital. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was a, a great show. Oh my God. So good. I, I, they, they took it off the air at some point. It's so good, but it, it talks about William Halstead, right? What, what I liked about that in the surgical history of it, they um, show the invention of all kinds of medical devices. And the invention of these medical devices was sort of serendipitous, like suction. You know, they're like, oh my God, all this bleeding, what are we going to do? We they need had something to do to... the manual crank. Yeah. It was insane. Yeah. And so I think there might have been a period of time when, you know, innovation was not cool, I suppose. But back then, it sure as heck was. That's one of the reasons I love this show because they just faced a problem and, like, we need to do something about this. And the whole thing about necessity being the mother of invention, that is obviously very true. If you have all your needs met, you're not going to think about anything. So surrounding yourself with problems is really the way to be an inventor, right? Because you get a chance to just understand. And I think that's one of the things that, that actually I would give somebody as a piece of advice. I don't know, I was thinking about this today. Whenever you meet somebody, they go, what do you do? You know, I, I'm a cleaner at the hospital. You might think that you don't have something to say to them. Maybe, you know, I don't move in these circles, but really I think, well, what's your day like? You know, I do this and do that. Oh, really? Like what works for you? You know, this works. What doesn't work for you? Oh, man, we do this, you know, with the recycling. And this is actually a true story. I am the founder of the Hospital Green Sustainability Committee, which meant I spoke to the cleaning staff at the hospital a lot about what we did. I'm like, really? You do? You take the one basket and you empty it into the other basket and then you do what with it? Why do you do that? And it was amazing as an opportunity to innovate in some place outside of medicine. And why does that happen? Oh, because we buy, my favorite thing was actually about ear tubes, a small amount of waste, but we put, we have two ears. So we put two tubes in. And interestingly, we bought one pack that had two spaces with one tube in it and a second pack with two spaces with one tube in it. And one day when I saw them opening two, where there was obviously two holes for two tubes, why do we buy that? I don't know. So I'll go up the chain. Why do we buy that? I don't know. Eventually somebody said, well, sometimes we put in one tube and we don't want to waste a tube. And I was like, well, how often does that happen? And they looked it up, you know, once three years ago. I'm like, so we put in, you know, 7,000 sets of tubes and we buy them all singly. So once three years ago, we didn't have to waste one tube. They immediately switched and now we buy, you know, two tubes in one container. So it reduced waste, reduced cost. It was, it was all around win. But you have to like ask those five questions, you know, and I forget what this example exactly is, but I really do enjoy it because it was about the, I think the Lincoln Memorial, you know, they had to repaint it all the time. Have you heard this? No, I haven't heard the story. No. The five whys. And so they're like, why do we have to repaint the Lincoln Memorial all the time? Well, the birds poo on it. No, we're cleaning it all the time. Why do we clean it all the time? Well, the birds poo on it. Well, why do the birds poo on it when they don't poo on the other ones? Well, there's lots of spiders. Well, why are there so many spiders on the Lincoln Memorial? because there's lots of flies at night and then they're catching them. Well, why are there so many flies on the Lincoln Memorial? Because they turn the lights on to illuminate it from outside and it's the closest one to the water. So all the flies fly around it and there's lots of spiders, lots of birds. And so they, instead of it being degraded and repainted all the time, 
they turned the lights on after dusk 20 minutes later and solved the problem, right? So that whole root cause analysis to solve the actual problem is really important. I literally love the power of why. And I tell every single medical student, resident, anybody that listened to me to always ask why. And I think in surgical education, it drives me crazy because everybody's like, well, that's just how it was done, right? This is just how we learned it. So there's a famous Pat Rose story. And I, I, I sometimes tell this, you know, a family was cooking dinner and the cook cut off the end of the pot roast to put it in the pot to put it in the oven. And the child asked, you know, why do you do that? And they said, well, my parent always did it that way. So then they went to their grandparents was like, why do we cut off the end of the pot roast? And they said, you know, I, I really don't know. My mom always did it that way. My dad always did it that way. And then they went to their to the next generation up and said, why do you do this? And they said, well, because I didn't have a pot big enough. Huh. But that is pervasive in education. It's pervasive in everything, in all products, is there's just a mindset of this is just how it was done. And I think you know, it, it drives me in, in medical education. It drives me at the hospital and quality improvement. You know, there was a, when I was working at a hospital, we were trying to improve the tracheostomy quality improvement care project. And what I realized was that the patients were spending, you know, X amount of days in the ICU and they, the parents weren't getting education and it actually delayed their discharge to the, from the hospital until they were able to come down to the step down unit to get their education. I said, well, why doesn't the educators just go into the ICU? And they're like, oh, we don't know. So when I dug in a little bit deeper, I found out that the respiratory care providers that were doing the education were a different cost center than the ICU. So they weren't able to bill in the ICU. So they just didn't go there. And so we, we quickly changed that. And magically, all of a sudden, we cut down the amount of uh, length of stay for those patients by like five or six days. It was impressive. But, you know, one of the things you, you, you sort of hit upon a few times is what is your advice for others, right? You, you've talked about having this intelligent ignorance, which should probably be the name of this episode, but intelligent ignorance and wonder. And what would your advice be for people who are interested in this space? I think you're totally right about the whole importance of asking why. I would say also that it's awkward to ask why per our earlier conversation about asking why is essentially a rejection of the status quo. You know, why do you do it that way? could be an implication that I think you should do it another way. Like I have this in my mind, the way I think I would do it. I'm asking you why you're doing it that way. And it also exposes people's ignorance about why they do things, which is sometimes embarrassing. And so while I entirely agree with you, it's important to ask why I would suggest that the person doing that be as respectful as possible, because you'll probably get further that way. And one thing I've learned about that is that it's actually okay to ask for that person's advice rather than saying, hey, why do you do it that way? Like you can ask them, can you give me some advice about why you're doing it this way? You know, and it's almost a respectful way of asking it versus a challenging way of asking it. I recognize that you're the expert, you know, what, what do you think about this? And, you know, so maybe how, why do you do it that way um, versus a straight up why? Because that's, that can go badly. What I would also say about the, your question per, you know, advice to others is stay problem focused. Because if you get too tied up in a cool, shiny object, you end up with a solution without a problem. So focus on the problems. Ideally, focus in your area, what makes you special, and uh, solve problems that uniquely you could solve because the world needs that. The world needs you to do what you know how to do. You've already said the thing about wonder, which is, you know, face the world optimistically and creatively, and, and I think you'll go further. And lastly, be persistent and expect to be a bit alone and a bit isolated. And don't worry about that. Because if you talk to any other innovator, and, and you should surround yourself with mentors, everyone feels like that. Because just by the nature of you being out front, you are out front alone. And that's okay. Absolutely. And you brought up, you know, solutions without problems. And we won't delve too deep into this, but we're in an era of a lot of media hype around certain technologies like virtual reality, artificial intelligence, you know, all these different things. What are you watching? What's exciting you? What are you interested in, in this technology innovation entrepreneurship space? I actually think there's a lot about digital health. It's time has finally come. And so pretty much anything you can do over the internet, particularly with COVID, that's something to follow. So whether that's remote logistics management and supply chain using 3D printing, which is something I'm involved in, it can all be essentially remote, which is amazing. Whether it's using data gathered from wearables to diagnose conditions or track rehabilitation, uh, that's definitely something also that can be remote via the internet and, and definitely somewhere to go. So I think 
one of the first gates that I would ask is, does this enable democratized access to healthcare, usually through the internet in some way or another? And if the answer is yes, it's probably a good thing. Are innovators born or bred? Born. One essential reading for anybody interested in this space. Mm, Zero to One by Peter Thiel. What are you reading right now? A Brief History of Humankind. One group that people interested in this space should join. Most geographies have a innovator group of some sort. I belong to this one in town called Fresh Founders. It's a great way to listen to people talk about their experience. And my last question, how do people find you? I guess if you're looking for me, you can reach out online. I have a LinkedIn profile, you know, I'm Matt Brownwich. You can find me there and uh, connect if you're interested. Anyone that's interested in accessing our hospital as a resource to validate products through research or co-develop uh, and access to physicians, I would actually love to hear from because uh, that's one thing we would love our hospital to be is a first point of contact for innovators in the community. And any parting words for our listeners? Thank you to you, Eric, about uh, having me and thank you to Backtable for hosting this. What a great discussion. I really enjoyed it. And to the innovators out there who are thinking about doing their own idea, short answer, start today. Don't wait. Just start. See what happens. It might not work, but that's okay. You'll enjoy the process. Just start today. Thank you so much, Dr. Matt Bromwich. Such a wonderful time having you. Please reach out. Please listen. Please subscribe. Thank you so much, everybody. 